Associate Professor Sushmita Roy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she is both an Associate Professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Medical Informatics and a faculty member at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. So her research lies at the intersection of machine learning and network-based methods for tackling problems in regulatory genomics. Interestingly, a group develops and applies computational methods for identifying regulatory networks that exist in living cells, and then investigates the dynamics of those regulatory networks across different biological contexts. So for this, she works closely with biologists who study a variety of normal and disease processes, including cancer, cell fate specification, host microbes interactions, and the evolution of gene regulation. So finally, she is the recipient of many prestigious honors and awards, which include an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship, an NFS Career Award, a University of Wisconsin Vilas Foundation Fellowship, and a James McDonald's Foundation Scholar Award. And today for this specific session of bioinformatics for women, so she will present us a work on network-based approaches for examining diseases and developmental processes. Thank you so much for the very nice introduction and thank you everyone for the invitation and also for adjusting the, the time of the seminar. I know that you know it's a typically a little bit earlier um, and I'm not a very uh, early morning person. So this uh, is very, very, uh, I'm very grateful for that. So um, yeah, so uh, what I'm going to do today is give you a sense of some of the work that we are doing. But I wanted to start off with a very high level picture of uh, uh, where we are with genomics. And I should start by saying that this is a great time to be a data scientist, especially in the genomics field. And through uh, 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 genomic advances and genomic tools, today we have the ability to measure basically the, at a very high precision uh, across multiple uh, biological contexts for different types of uh, 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 diseases and different uh, tissue contexts. We can get a high throughput uh, profiling of individual uh, cell types and tissues at this, even at the single cell level. And we have all of this very rich molecular data. And now the challenge is to try to be able to use these types of uh, data sets to get an understanding uh, at a mechanistic level, what is going on for a, for a novel process versus a, a, a disease process. And here, uh, network-based approaches offer a very powerful set of tools to try to look at living systems, uh, both normal and disease systems, uh, in a variety of different ways. And here I'm just uh, talking about, uh, I've listed four uh, different problem areas or, or areas that develop tools to look at different uh, uh, problems. Um, and uh, basically this is not the entire list that the other uh, problems that are based on network-based approaches, but these are some of the important uh, problems that uh, some of the approaches that are out there that we've been also using in our group. So what I wanted to do is uh, talk about some of these areas uh, by giving you an overview of uh, three project directions uh, that uh, are largely in the realm of looking at uh, gene regulatory networks in mammalian systems. So the first problem is that of network inference. And this is a problem that we uh, work a lot on and is a, is a problem that a lot of others have also worked on. But just so that we are all on the same page, let me just give a little bit of a overview of what I mean by regulatory networks and gene regulatory network inference. So what is a regulatory network? Uh, a regulatory network is a network that describes connections between uh, regulatory proteins such as X1 and X2 that uh, drive the expression of a gene Y. And we depict this information as directed graphs uh, showing arrows from these regulators to this target gene Y. Why are these networks important? Uh, they are important because they affect a bunch of different uh, processes. And across evolution, we know that changes of the gene regulatory machinery are associated with species diversity. Across developmental uh, processes, changes at the transcriptional level or transcriptional regulatory network drive different cell fates. And 
in many diseases, disruptions in the gene regulatory network can, uh, uh, can influence the, uh, the pathogenicity of a particular disease. So, there, so regulatory networks are really important and we want to be able to infer them, but mapping these networks is a hard problem. And the reason is that there are many levels, and I'm just listing some of them, that control whether a particular regulator can regulate the expression of a gene. So we have uh, transcription factors that have to bind to the gene promoter, or it can bind to uh, uh, regions that are far away from gene through long range gene regulation. Whether a protein can bind to a particular regulatory region depends upon the chromatin environment. And then there are post-translational modifications that uh, can also affect the, uh, the, uh, the impact of uh, or whether a regulator can actually actively regulate a particular gene. So there are experimental and computational ways to try to uh, map these networks. One way that we've been working along with many others in the field is to try to do computational network inference using an approach called expression-based network inference. So at its very vanilla form, what this is is really, we want to take in as input uh, gene expression matrices across a bunch of different conditions and then uh, push it through an algorithm. And there are a number of different algorithms that differ depending upon the way in which they establish uh, relationships between regulators and target genes and outcomes and network. Uh, and, at, and it's very, uh, at a very high level, what these algorithms are really trying to do is based on gene expression, they are trying to predict what are the best predictors of a particular target gene. So we are trying to learn these psi functions. So that's a general principle that most network inference algorithms use. They're trying to figure out who are the best predictors of uh, a particular target gene X4. So in this case, X1, X2, X3 should be the best predictors. And then algorithms differ as to how they uh, model this particular psi function. And this approach has been very successful in many uh, areas. And these are some high profile papers that have tried to uh, use gene expression alone and try to infer uh, uh, regulatory networks. Uh, but the problem is that uh, network inference remains a difficult problem. And the question is, can, how can we do better? Most have just used gene expression. And then we know that the ground truth, especially in mammalian system, that is what we mean by a true regulatory interaction is, uh, is incomplete. So, so where the field is going right now in this area of gene network inference is to try to leverage other auxiliary sources of data that tell us something about gene regulation. So beyond gene expression, we want to incorporate other things like accessibility, chromatin state, sequence specific motifs that are, uh, that are also available that could be used to try to infer these gene regulatory networks. And uh, there have been several approaches by us and others. And one approach has been to try to use these uh, other types of data as priors. And then another approach that what I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail is to try to use something called TFA or uh, transcription factor activity levels. So if you go back to the problem of gene network inference from gene expression data, we are trying to use the mRNA level of a regulator to predict the expression level of a target gene. But we know that the mRNA level is uh, just a proxy and it has been shown that this can, uh, can result in uh, not very good uh, uh, performance. Uh, and this could be one of the reasons why the regulatory network is not very well inferred from computational methods. So the question is, can we relax this assumption? And that's where TFA comes into play. So the idea is instead of using just the direct mRNA level of the transcription factors or the regulators, can we do something better in terms of estimating the potential activity levels of the regulator? And so the idea is to use something called network component analysis. And this work actually, uh, the, gen the idea of network component analysis was actually introduced in a PNAS paper several years ago, but uh, now it has become, uh, is, is uh, coming into network inference uh, more recently. So the idea is, let's say that we have an initial noisy network and an initial input network. Um, so uh, what this is saying is uh, what we can do using that network uh, and mRNA level uh, uh, available for a bunch of different conditions, we can uh, try to 
estimate the activity levels. So we write the gene expression matrix where we have genes along the rows and experiments along the columns and write it as a product of two matrices, A and P, where A is the, activity, the network connectivity that we want to uh, uh, also estimate and the activity, the hidden activity of the regulators. And the way this works is using an iterative process where we iterate between estimating these two quantities. And the way this works in network inference is because you might be wondering, wait, I'm trying to solve the network inference problem. Where is, where do I get the network from? So this is like, you know, you have an input network which may be coming from say accessibility or, uh, or sequence specific motifs. And then we feed that and, uh, to NCN, estimate activity levels. And then we use those activity levels and the mRNA levels together to predict the inferred network. So that's the general idea of uh, TFA and NCA uh, and how that fits into network inference. The problem, however, has been that this assumes that the input network, the existing approaches, really just take in the input network as given. And they don't really model anything about or don't consider anything about whether the network is noisy. So what we did was we carried out some simulations where we asked if we have some noise in the network, how much does that actually affect the estimated TFA and how much does that actually affect the network structure accuracy? And what we see is that as you increase the amount of noise, the, uh, the TFA that we estimate and along with the network structures that we estimate, the performance actually goes down. So what we, uh, together with a, a ex, uh, an ex-member in my group who he's now, uh, uh, he's graduated, um, developed a regularized approach where instead of just taking the network as given, we would, uh, we would uh, put in something based on the confidence of the input network. And this could be something like the strength of a sequence specific motif or some additional source of information that we could use to try to constrain the, uh, the, the step of trying to estimate the activity levels. So here we used a, a lasso based framework to try to constrain the extent of uh, um, the extent to which we want to incorporate a particular regulator. So, um, what we find is that when we incorporate this kind of regularization where we penalize an, a model that is too complex, but subject to the extent to which it is supported by prior knowledge, we find that uh, our performance actually improves quite a bit and the, uh, in simulations. And we find that uh, as we um, uh, tune the amount of regularization, we get better and better performance. So this was in simulations, how does it work with real data? So we start with yeast. We always start with yeast with network inference because yeast has one of the best gold standards. And what I'm showing you here is just a general pipeline where we have gene expression data. And uh, we used a simple motif-based prior where we scanned the gene promoters and found motif sequences. And then we fed that into Merlin PTFA, which is our new algorithm um, that uh, then outputted uh, an inferred network. And then we estimate, uh, the, our, uh, estimate the accuracy of this algorithm based on area under the precision recall curve and also some other metrics like, like how, many, how many regulators am I able to significantly predict targets of and so on. But I'm going to just show you the results of the area under the precision recall curve. And as gold standards used uh, collections of chip, chip, chip seek uh, experiments as well as uh, knockouts of uh, transcription factors. So what you're seeing on the left is a precision recall curve. And uh, each of these lines correspond to different algorithms that are out there. And then in the red circle are methods that make use of this TFA idea. And what we can see is that uh, there, so uh, there are, you can see that, you know, the Merlin PTFA algorithm. So a good algorithm is one that actually has high area under the precision recall curve. And that is being summarized in this bar plot over here. And we can see that the Merlin, P algorithm, Merlin PTFA algorithm is performing uh, better than the other algorithms. And uh, when we compare the different algorithms, um, we see that um, there, are, there are like some algorithms that are better than existing algorithms, but overall the Merlin PTFA algorithm seems to perform better than these other algorithms. And so what I, I wanted to mention is that Merlin P really is using a regularized TFA. Uh, and what we can do is ask whether this regularized TFA is actually uh, beneficial for other algorithms as well that, did, that just use uh, TFA uh, uh, before without any kind of cleanup. 
And what we see is that when we use the regularized TFA as opposed to the unregularized TFA, other algorithms that um, um, did not use that also see a performance boost. So that was a nice uh, thing to see. And this was all on yeast. Uh, now, moving on, we are very interested to actually infer gene regulator networks in mammalian systems. And so what we did was we collected gene expression data from uh, publicly available uh, resources like gene expression omnibus and other resources um, like Meta SRA, which has some uh, curated uh, gene expression data sets uh, for different uh, cell lines in, in human where uh, these are basically cell lines that are of interest to us because we have collaborators looking at the embryonic stem cell state, as well as some popular cell lines that people use as uh, uh, systems to study. And we collected these data sets and then we uh, fed them through a Merlin PTFA and then we validated these networks by looking at different uh, sources like uh, that, uh, uh, for example, uh, again, chip chip uh, and chip seek experiments. And what we see is that, uh, so there are uh, multiple bars here and I'm just showing you the performance of Merlin uh, algorithms. So Merlin is basically that doesn't use any prior information. Merlin B uses prior information and both these algorithms can be also given uh, TFA. And what we see is that generally when we use TFA, uh, the black or the red bars are generally higher than the gray bars, but the red bar also seems to have an advantage in several of these different situations. Um, but it is certainly the advantage we see is much better in yeast compared to what we see in the mammalian systems. But one of the things that uh, we have been uh, 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 um, struggling with is the lack of good ground truth. So one of the things that we are very interested to do is to try to make use of the predictions that a model actually gives. So a network inference algorithm makes so many predictions are, um, and the precision recall numbers that we get are so low are these algorithms really doing something completely wrong? Or is there any advantage, or is, is there any uh, biological signal that we actually get from these predictions? And this is where we've teamed up with uh, collaborators at UW Madison. So Rupa Sridharan is, is a stem cell biologist, and these, this is uh, a student in her lab, and then um, and Sunny Grace is a student in my lab. And together we've been trying to validate some of our predictions. So the overall pipeline is as follows, and this is doing very low throughput, in a sense, a low throughput, because one could also do high throughput validations. Um, so what we've done is we've taken Merlin PTFA, we have prioritized regulators, so we identified 60 regulators that include known as well as novel regulators. And then what we've done is in a given ESC cell line, we've knocked down that regulator and then asked, does the uh, embryonic stem cells um, um, a phenotype change, and this is done by looking at the number of fluorescent uh, nanog uh, fluorescent colonies. So nanog is a key uh, ES marker, and uh, if it doesn't change the phenotype, we discard it. So it's probably not a good regulator. And then once we've identified a good regulator, uh, we uh, measure the targets using RT-PCR. So this is where the low throughput uh, thing is, and we are now working on scaling this up. So here is just an example of what we get. This is uh, a network that is centered around a particular regulator called ESRRB that um, is, uh, is a key regulator in uh, embryonic stem cell fate. And these are basically predicted interactions. And the edge weight corresponds to the confidence that we have in predicting the interactions. And then the pink uh, um, uh, are the pink nodes are the targets. And then we are also showing other regulators that we predict as associated regulating this particular target gene. And then over here is the fold change that we see compared to control and for all of the targets. So there are, I think, uh, I counted it last night, but I think there are 18 bars over here. And of the 18, that 13 that we can predict to be significant, there are some that are completely wrong that we don't get at all. But many of them we are predicting to be uh, exhibiting change in uh, expression uh, uh, when we re regulate and for many of them, we also predict a significant change in expression. So this is certainly better than what we actually observe when we just look at the existing gold standards. And right now we are trying to figure out uh, why uh, in some of the cases that the regulator uh, predictions that we make are actually not uh, not correct. And one possible reason could be that for some of these target genes, there are other regulators that are also important. And at a time, we are only now knocking down one regulator. So there may be some compensations that are happening that you're not able to capture. 
So that concludes the first part of my talk, which is really focusing on gene network inference. And what I wanted to uh, say is that uh, what we want to do is, and we've seen this and others have seen this, is gene expression is a useful source of information, perhaps uh, one of the very useful sources of information, but it alone is not enough. And we want to be able to incorporate other sources of information. Uh, and we find that using TFA is beneficial, and but one important thing to keep in mind is that the, the predictions is computational inference is just the first step. And what we would like to be able to do is really do this in an iterative way, where we uh, use the model to generate some predictions and then try to see how well they do, and then try to use that to update the model. So now I'm going to shift gears and tell you about another uh, project that we've been working on, and that is looking at 3D genome organization. So, um, so in mammalian systems, uh, the expression of a particular gene can be regulated by an element, a regulatory element, such as an enhancer that can be up to a megabase away. And this element can regulate the expression of a gene through looping. And uh, we are still trying to understand the mechanisms, we as in the community, but we know that uh, uh, some of this happens through uh, the uh, uh, a combination of factors such as transcription factors, um, uh, general transcription factors, as well as chromatin state that can enable the DNA to fold and, uh, 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 and uh, facilitate these long range interactions. And there are several uh, high throughput uh, ways to try to look at these looping interactions and one of them is high C. And what you're seeing here is what we get out of a high C experiment. We, this is looking at all versus all genomic loci and then telling us the extent to uh, uh, how, how close they are in three-dimensional space, which is measured through these uh, high throughput experiments. And this is just for the entire human, uh, human genome and just a blow up of one of the chromosomes. So along the diagonal are basically uh, uh, genome, genomic loci that are close together and we see very st red uh, strong interactions. Whereas as we fa go far away from the diagonal, we see a gradual depletion of these interactions. And uh, one of the things that people have been trying to look at is how the 3D genome organization uh, changes across uh, uh, different diseases and developmental processes. And people have seen that in both normal and uh, 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 disease processes, they have associated disruptions in what are called these topologically associated domains that look like these triangles along the diagonal um, that uh, could be responsible for some of these uh, both pathological as well as normal uh, processes. So identifying what are called these topologically associating domains has been an important computational problem. And there are several approaches that are out there. And I'm just listing some of them. And however, some people have uh, also uh, compared these approaches and have shown that one of the issues with these methods is that they don't agree with what is a TAD and also that they tend to be uh, sensitive to the extent of uh, noise or sparsity in the data, which is, uh, which is an issue for high C matrices, uh, high C data sets. So what uh, we developed together with a grad student in my group uh, is an approach called Grinch. And she has a knack to actually come up with really nice graphics to illustrate uh, a particular method. But I don't know if people know about Grinch, but this is a cartoon character. Uh, in any case, so this is just an overview of what the Grinch approach is really doing. It's basically using an approach based on non-negative matrix factorization, and then brings in another thing which enables us to somehow uh, constrain the factors a little bit more. So let me tell you a little bit about all of these different components. So the first component is non-negative matrix factorization. So the idea of this approach is, let's say that we have a matrix this green matrix, this can be written, this has, uh, tip, most matrices actually have a low dimensional represent or can be uh, largely well approximated through some low dimensional representations. So NMF is one such approach where we write this entire matrix as a product of two lower dimensional matrices, U and V. And just to give you an idea of what this uh, is approach is doing, let's say that we have another matrix where we have movies along the rows and uh, uh, people along the columns and this matrix, each entry corresponds to the uh, uh, pref preference of each uh, person for a movie. And oftentimes these matrices, as I said, have a low, uh, low rank representation. So in this case, it turns out that this particular matrix is really made up of the product of two matrices, two lower dimensional matrices, U and V, that correspond to uh, two groups of people that tend to watch two types of movies. Um, and so basically NMF and uh, tries to 
try, right, try to find this UNV matrices. And once you find these matrices, then we can identify this grouping structure as well. Now, in addition to just factorization, another thing that we can sometimes leverage is if we have some domain information about the relationship between the individuals or between the row or the column entities. And then we can use that as a way to further constrain the solution that we get with NMF. So in this case, let's say that we have a, a, a graph that connects these uh, uh, five people and these two people, we can use that as a way to constrain it. And the way it is done is as follows. So this is our original objective. We add in some additional terms that enable us to uh, constrain the solution where L is basically the Laplacian of a graph that, uh, uh, that enables us to measure how smooth is our factorization with respect to the topology of the graph. And this graph is again, something like, uh, which we are getting from domain information. So the Laplacian is, uh, is uh, written as D minus A, which the D is a diagonal matrix corresponding to the uh, degree of a graph and then, um, is the adjacency matrix. And so what you can see, for, for example, for this example graph is that the, the graph structure, uh, the, the, the clustering of the graph uh, is uh, immediately apparent from the Laplacian uh, of this particular graph. And so what, uh, what our approach is basically trying to do is trying to regularize the U's and the V's such that they're smooth on the graph. So what is the graph in our case? In our case, the graph is simply the neighborhood graph. And what we want to do is incorporate this distance dependence such that the solutions that we get in NMF are smooth across uh, regions that are close together on the, on the genome. Uh, and then uh, once we have this, we basically, uh, once we have the factors, we can get the clusters or TADs by, uh, we use a, a K-medioids algorithm that uh, just helps us to get even tighter TAD clusters. Um, so we compared the algorithm, Grinch algorithm, to other existing algorithms. And what you're seeing here is um, we are trying to ask how good, how tight are the TAD clusters that we get. So the higher the bar, the better. And uh, we see that, uh, so the, and these are two different metrics that we use. And we see that Grinch is uh, among the top methods and, um, and, uh, and it is able to perform among the top two or three methods in terms of getting the cluster quality. Uh, the second thing that we looked at is how stable are the, uh, how stable is uh, Grinch? So what we did was uh, we got data from, uh, um, uh, so I should have mentioned this before, but this is data set, uh, a data set from the Rao et al. Uh, paper uh, that um, uh, collected basically different resolution data sets. And so the GM cell line is a high resolution data set. And what we, uh, uh, what we found is that um, uh, so this is basically saying we take a high depth data set and then we downsample it into uh, data sets that are uh, lower uh, depth, so K562 and so on. And then we are trying to basically take this low depth data, identify TADs in the low depth data and the high depth data, and then try to see how well they actually agree with each other. And what we are seeing here is the agreement that we measure based on two metrics, RAND index and mutual information. And we see that again, Grinch is able to perform as well or better than uh, several other approaches. Uh, beyond that, Grinch, uh, so uh, most approaches in uh, that work with uh, uh, this type of data are really just trying to find tags, but because Grinch is based on this NMF approach, it can also do something called matrix completion. So it can predict entries in the matrix that are not there. And what we, uh, what we uh, are now trying to do is trying to see whether the smoothing capability that Grinch offers by doing this matrix completion is that beneficial for recovering uh, aspects of the uh, chromosome organization like TADs as well as significant interactions. And again, uh, we are uh, trying to compare uh, this with low depth versus high depth data. And we are comparing Grinch versus other approaches like uh, uh, just trying to use uh, a simple mean filter or a Gaussian filter to try to see how well they do. And we see that the Grinch approach is able to perform well in terms of recovering TADs as well as in inferring significant interactions. Uh, and then we've applied Grinch to also look at just other data sets to see what in terms of the biology we are pulling out. And this is just an example, looking at a particular high c data set, uh, looking at uh, differentiation going from embryonic stem cell state to uh, cortical neuron. And what we are seeing is that 
early the, uh, uh, develop in the ESC state, we see that there, um, there is not a lot of chromatin uh, uh, changes happening. Uh, but as we progress, we see the formation of a, uh, of a new TAD. And this was an example that was actually discussed in this paper, but we have other examples where we find new things. And uh, a, a correspondingly with the Grinch TAD, we also see the presence of specific markers, uh, chromatin signals that also help us bolster the predictions that we make. So just to summarize the second part of my talk, uh, this is basically an approach uh, which is based on non-negative matrix factorization together with using a, a, a distance dependence graph to try to smooth the factors. And what we find is that Grinch is able to perform well in terms of uh, uh, how well it is able to recover the topologies uh, as well as uh, has this ability to try to smooth the, uh, the different uh, um, matrices and uh, an initial application to looking at uh, developmental processes helps us to identify some interesting topological units as well as changes in the units. Uh, with that, I wanna just talk uh, about the last part of my talk, which I think uh, kind of ties in uh, networks in, in an interesting way. And this is uh, looking at regulatory variation. So, um, uh, and this is a plot from uh, many years ago where, and this is known now in the field that a, a lot of the variation that we see in the genome tends to be uh, far away from genes and much of it is non-coding. And trying to interpret this non-coding variation is really a big challenge right now. And one way in which we could try to interpret, and what I mean by interpret is what does it do, what genes it is associated with, what pathways does it actually affect, uh, one way to add that is to look at uh, long range gene regulation where a variant in a particular regulatory element such as an enhancer could impact the expression of a gene and uh, could uh, affect the expression of a single gene through perturbing a particular looping interaction, but also could disrupt topologically associated domains. And um, we could use that information as a way to try to add information or interpret these different types of regulatory variants. Um, but the challenge is that uh, most of the high C data that could be used to identify these looping interactions tend to be low resolution. So just to give you an idea, uh, in reality, we want to observe uh, enhancer promoter interactions, and uh, but we typically tend to bin the data into different fixed size bins, and the bins need to be small enough to be able to reliably detect looping interactions. So the problem is that these types of high resolution data sets tend to be sparse, the, are, I mean, are not very widely available. So, uh, however, people have seen, and we've also seen that in, um, uh, is that when uh, oftentimes when there is a looping interaction, there are chromatin signals that correspond to those types of, uh, or there's an association at the chromatin level or the one dimensional level that can, be, uh, that can ref uh, tell us something about these looping interactions. So the question is, can we computationally predict this? And we have uh, uh, attempted this by developing an approach called high c reg, which the idea of this approach is to try to use uh, measurements that are easy to measure like uh, histone modifications, and then try to train a, a, a machine learning model and try to predict these interactions in a high throughput manner. Um, but what now we are doing is leveraging publicly available data sets uh, that are, are there from uh, consortia as well as individual labs, and then try to use that as a way to try to predict across a bunch of different cell lines. And here, what we've done is taken the roadmap data set um, where, um, and 55 cell lines looking at a bunch of different histone modifications as well as accessibility to predict significant interactions, map them to SNPs, and then link them to genes, and then try to understand what those interactions do. So this is just to give you a sense of the different cell lines, and we've clustered them or hierarchically organized them just to give you a sense of the different types of cell types that we can get. But using this, what we've done is we've tried to uh, link different non-coding variants in the NAGRI, EBI, GWAS catalog, and we've tried to interpret about 23,000 uh, different uh, SNPs. Uh, and what do these predictions look like? So this is an example of a particular SNP that is uh, identified in rheumatoid arthritis. And this we predict to link to a particular gene, hsd 117 b 8 Here's another example of another gene that, uh, that we link to this, uh, another SNP associated with vitiligo. And in all of them, uh, so here's the gene with the significant interaction. We can see some association with these different histone modification uh, signals. 
But beyond that, we want to try to actually ask the question about groups of SNPs. And because oftentimes, almost always we have a particular GWAS study and that gives us a bunch of different SNPs and we want to look at all of them. So we really want to be able to take uh, uh, and get an understanding of how these groups of SNPs really perturb at a, at a, a pathway level uh, things that are um, uh, might be go going on. So the way we are doing this right now, and this is really work in progress, uh, we're taking molecular networks from publicly available data sets, databases like a string, adding together our long range as well as promote proximal interactions using DNS data, and then uh, constructing a network and then doing this in a cell line specific way, and then adding on SNPs and then using uh, graph diffusion based approaches to try to get other, what potential other indirect targets, and then clustering that to try to identify different potential pathways that might be uh, involved in a particular uh, phenotype. So this is just to give you an idea of how, what this looks like. So we decided to take on uh, uh, um, this uh, autism spectrum disorder SNPs, and we've ident uh, there are um, about 170 non-coding SNPs, uh, and some other uh, uh, SNPs that are in linkage with these SNPs that we've connected to uh, about 530 genes across 55 different cell lines using our uh, cell type specific uh, long range interactions. So, uh, and this is just a ranking of how many genes we get across uh, all our 55 cell lines. And among the uh, one of the uh, top ranking genes, uh, top ranking cell lines that we get is fetal brain that has uh, several of the genes that we see that are connected to uh, links, uh, uh, to SNPs. And, and we've basically tried to cluster this data. This is an initial uh, uh, picture that we are getting. And we can see that, uh, so each of the nodes are colored based on the cluster that they belong to. Uh, and there are some clusters like the purple cluster over here that is in, involved in neuronal development. There are some that are uh, involved in transcription, but this is something that we are now um, uh, trying to figure out how to do this across multiple cell lines and then try to see what are the different types of pathways. Uh, but hopefully this gives you a sense of how we can use these kinds of resources to try to interpret variants and try to identify potential pathways that might be uh, involved in a particular phenotype of interest. So with that, I just want to take uh, summarize with our take home messages. So network-based approaches along, uh, is, for example, the ones that I talked about offer a powerful set of tools to try to look at a variety of biological and biomedical problems. And I talked about the network inference problem and how that can be used to try to predict the uh, regulatory network of a particular cell type or a cell line. And this networks can also be used as a framework to try to constrain the topology uh, of the, uh, the solution that we get, as well as a way to try to interpret or provide a background scaffold to try to interpret uh, variation or other high throughput data sets. Beyond that, something that people have worked on, uh, a lot of people have worked on is to try to look at gene prioritization, data integration, and also to try to use networks as uh, predictive models. So with that, I would just like to thank my collaborators and uh, my group who really do all the work and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sushmita, for this amazing talk. It's really fascinating how you uh, managed to integrate machine learning with the network topology into such uh, important topics uh, from network inference to genome 3D organization to interpreting regular variation that's in the non-coding part. I mean, absolutely amazing. Um, I would like to, to welcome some questions now. Um, let me see. If, I guess you just guys just uh, start speaking. I think I think that's okay. or raise a hand or whatever. Sorry, I don't, uh, I'm not sure how to do this on Zoom. Uh, hello. Uh, hi. hi, I have a question. Uh, thank you so much, Sushmita, for the great uh, presentation. Um, I have a question on the, um, the uh, confidence, no, the, the regularization that you are applying. For instance, in the first case, uh, you mentioned uh, that you are using domain prior knowledge. Uh, so uh, the question is about the, the, the quality of these priors and, uh, and how to be sure that, you, that the 
so actually useful uh, and uh, and give the you know, right possibly. yeah yeah so you're absolutely right so the thing is that we don't want to assume that the priors are actually very good. We assume that the priors are noisy. So we don't want the prior to uh, completely overrule the solution. And so we have, uh, so when we do these regularizations, there is a parameter, the Lambda parameter uh, that we can use to tune how much we want the solution to be influenced by the, uh, the these existing sources of uh, knowledge and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and, um, we do want the ultimately want the, the the data that is a gene expression data to drive the solution, um, and so yeah, so you could use that regularization, the, the lambda, to be able to kind of tune how much you want to uh, make the prior influence. But uh, it's clearly a trade-off, and then you know you could use cross validation as one way to do it. Uh, to be honest, you know, uh, I we don't have a very good way to do it, and we said okay, look at simulation, and that's like you know based on simulations, the lambda of something looks like, you know, it's doing a good job and then, you know, use that as something to look at real data. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but it has to be a trade-off and you're kind of assuming that the input data are noisy. And so you kind of don't want to use it, but maybe you, uh, you're assuming, however, that the, at least the high confidence that is there in the prior is is like you know informative, and so there's like a ranking on the edges. Uh, so if that's completely wrong, then uh, then you, again, hopefully the lambda will kick in and not confuse the the results too much. And then uh, another question is uh, is more a curiosity. So um, this uh, information about uh, regulatory networks is, uh, can, can be also taken, uh, uh, for instance, from uh, um, papers, no, through natural language processing or text mining uh, approaches. I, I was wondering whether you tried to use this information uh, or if you think that it's maybe not necessary. So I wouldn't say it's not necessary. I just think that, you know, it's something we've not tried it. And I know that, you know, people have tried to use text mining as a way to predict uh, these regulatory relationships. And I just, uh, again, worry about like, you know, the confidence and like, I, I've, as you said, like, you know, it may just bring in too much noise. And so some of them are probably correct, but some of them are probably uh, may confuse the results. So we just use a simple prior, we just use sequence specific motifs. Uh, and um, we use literature as a way to try to validate, uh, go back and see, you know, if we can provide support for our interactions. But uh, we've not used it as one way, uh, but it could be used as a potential source of, uh, um, as a prior in the, in the model. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Vanessa, I believe. Yes, uh, wait, I will try to start my video. Yes, hi, um, Shijimita, I had a couple of questions. The first, you talked about simulations. Um, how do you then simulate the data or what simulator do you use um, when you talk about simulations for the first part of your talk about the network inference part? Yeah, so we've actually used uh, different types of simulations. In this one, in this particular project, we actually had a very simple kind of a model because you were trying to estimate like the TFA. Um, and so I think we had uh, like, you know, we estimated what uh, we had a network and then uh, we had some random activity and then we pro multiplied that and uh, obtained some gene expression through that. So you were kind of trying to make the data very, very um, similar to what the actual what model we are trying to learn. But in general, with gene network inference, we also use other types of simulation simulators. So what we would do is we would generate the network topology and that you can generate either by, let's say, you know, uh, taking an existing network and then maybe making some changes to it. But then the, the way you generate the data, there is something called GNET Weaver that we use um, that uh, it makes, uh, makes use of like, uh, I think uh, stochastic uh, differential equations to try to generate more realistic gene expression data. Yeah, I know it, but I thought maybe there was some more recent, but if you think it's still uh, yeah, good to use the GNET Weaver uh, to do so. I I yeah. think it's pretty good. Now, more recently, yeah. people are actually using uh, developing single cell simulators, uh, data, uh, simulators that can generate single cell data. Um, 
we've used some of them. They're okay. They don't capture the sparsity. So you kind of have to do much more. So it's like hard to find a simulator that will generate single cell data based on a network. I think mm -hmm. that's the challenge. Yeah, exactly. And the second question I had was about um, so the, the activity, the transcription factor activity that you're using, um, it, just to be clear, is this similar to, for instance, what the tool Dorothea does, or is this still different because you use the net, this network component analysis? Uh, I don't know if you know this I, Dorothea from this. I know, I know the paper Dorothea, uh, and, but the way I, uh, the aspect that I'm only remembering is that they did a lot of curation and they collected a lot of like these you know, they looked at a whole bunch of different data sets and they came up with a curated set of, you know, TF target relationships. And I know they mentioned TF activity, but I never quite got what, but I didn't read it very carefully. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I am I'm, I'm unable they, they to use a lot of, I think they use a lot of prior uh, information and, and so it's all based on yeah existing data types and then they, they look at what are kind of like the targets of the mm -hmm transcription factor and they take the information from the targets as the activity of the transcription factor but this is not what you are using in this model right? this is different i think no 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 we do use the the topology of the network to estimate the activity uh, but uh, so in maybe maybe it is similar in that way but like all of this is really based on this approach called network component analysis, mm -hmm. uh, which was like in, developed in 2003, where the idea is, you know, you have some in initial noisy network and you are trying to basically estimate the activity of a transcription factor for which you have the expression level. Um, how exactly, so that's the general idea. And that's what like mm -hmm. we've used, that's what uh, this, uh, these other yeah, approaches that exactly. we looked at. So maybe Dorothea used something similar as well. So in that way, like, you know, I would say maybe TFA activity, but the how exactly how they're estimating is probably different. Probably different. Okay. Thank you so much for this nice talk. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? I don't see any raised hands. Anybody? Okay. Um, uh, so, um, this is a, a bioinf um, bioinformatics for women uh, session. Uh, so, as uh, some of us have already told you, um, would you maybe like to share some of your experiences as a woman in this field? Um, uh, if you have any maybe advice for uh, young uh, women entering the field, etc. How has it been for you? Yeah, so I should say that it has been a lot of fun. And, you know, I think um, I would say that, you know, I'm, I was very fortunate to have like, you know, mentors along the way who had been always supportive to like, you know, let me pursue the things that I wanted to. So like, you know, starting from my PhD, I had an advisor in biology as well as in computer science. And they were like, you know, helping me. I, when I got my PhD, uh, which is quite a few years ago, uh, we didn't have a proper computational biology program. And so I was like an outlier, but they were very supportive. So I would say that, you know, finding the right kind of mentors, uh, well, it's always tricky, but find a lot of mentors. And again, through my postdoc, uh, I had like, again, two mentors and I didn't like intentionally choose it. It just happened that way. But, um, you know, having mentors, but like finding role models and, you know, trying to, you know, have several examples of that is actually very, very helpful. I also feel like, you know, uh, just go with your gut feeling, you know, that's like, uh, that's so important just to feel, figure out like how you feel about a particular thing. Don't be afraid just ask questions and, you know, have, I, I, I just feel like attitude is just so important towards research and towards like these difficult problems. And, you know, I think we all can do like uh, different, like interesting types of research. I think just having the types of, I think the most important thing is to have a kind of a can-do attitude that uh, kind of helps uh, towards uh, trying to like, you know, doing these kinds of things. So, so, you know, as, as a woman, I don't, I haven't really experienced like 
I know that many of my colleagues, and I've heard of things where there has been a lot of bias, and you know, we've we've read about all of these kind of things that keep happening. I've personally not experienced, and I've been fortunate to not experience these kinds of things. Um, but uh, I've had like you know supportive environment. But I would say that you know just you know knowing just figure listening to your inner voice and like you know trying different things, finding different mentors. Uh, and you know, building a peer network has been really uh, has been really nice. Good, good. That's great. That is great to hear. Um, any other questions, guys? From anybody? All right. Um, so then uh, we could end this session. And Sushmita has uh, several uh, more individual meetings with several of us. I think three this afternoon, and perhaps some tomorrow. Uh, so then maybe we can we can uh, you know break the, the session. Thank you so much. This has been very nice. Thanks a lot for spending Thank you. The time. It's Thank very you. nice to hear your thoughts on on all of these things. And then I think I'm next to talk to you. Maybe we can take five minute break for you to rest a yes. little bit and then meet as well. Yeah. Thanks so much. See you in a bit. See you Bye. Bye-bye.